All right. Hello, everybody. So good to see you. Thank you all so much for joining this evening. So my name again is Timothy Sullivan, and I'm going to be the lecturer for tonight. Um, I just wanted to give you a quick rundown about what we're going to be discussing tonight. Uh, we're going to be talking first about sake etiquette, and we're going to do about a 30-minute lecture about sake etiquette and sake manners. Then we're going to do about a 15-minute Q&A. In the last 15 minutes, I'm going to introduce you to 16 of the breweries of the Japan Sake Export Association. And uh, we're going to talk a little bit about the sakes that were recommended for this evening. Um, I want to thank Dr. Walker very much for the lovely introduction. And I also want to thank the Japan Society and the Talks Plus program for arranging tonight and asking me to be the speaker. Um, we have a live chat running in the YouTube Live. If you have a question for us as we're going along, please feel free to share it in the chat, and they'll be getting the questions to me uh, for our Q&A session in about half an hour. So please feel free to uh, share any of the questions that you have going forward. All right, so the first question I wanna ask is, why should we learn about sake etiquette? Uh, what's the uh, big deal about sake etiquette, and why is it important for us to talk about? Well. I think that I've, one thing I've always said is that sake is Japanese culture in a cup. And sake really is a microcosm of Japanese culture. And I think that if you learn the etiquette, the manners, the culture of sake, you're really studying Japan. And for me, it's been a wonderful 15 years learning about sake culture and uh, etiquette and manners has been a big part of that. I also think when you learn about a, a foreign culture, you're really showing a sign of respect to that culture, and you're showing an interest in that culture. Uh, when I was in high school, I actually spent one year abroad in West Berlin, and I lived with a German family for 12 months. And one thing I learned that has served me my whole life was to respect the way that they did things. And I took that on very early in my life. And when I got involved with sake later in life, uh, that, again, served me very, very well. So really respecting the way other cultures do things um, can open up whole new doors and whole new vistas. And I think that's true for sake etiquette as well. And in Japan, there's this concept of wa. Wa is defined as uh, promoting peaceful unity or conformity within a social group. And uh, we're gonna talk a lot about that this evening. A lot of the etiquette and manners that you see related to sake have to do with promoting and preserving the sense of wa, the sense of a harmony of the group. And uh, we're gonna talk a little bit about that tonight. And also I think it's just polite to learn about etiquette. Uh, just like we all got taught not to put our elbows on the table, uh, I think that uh, learning about etiquette is, is uh, uh, just a polite thing to do and it will serve us very, very well. So um, if some of you can't stay with us the whole hour, I wanna give you the golden rule of sake etiquette right at the beginning. If you can only learn one thing from tonight, I want you to learn this one golden rule. And that is don't pour sake for yourself. Many of you might've heard this before, uh, but this is the golden rule. Um, it's considered impolite to pour sake for yourself. And I've even heard some people say that pouring sake for yourself is gonna give you bad luck, uh, all kinds of things like that. But in general, it's just considered bad form and impolite to pour sake for yourself. Uh, so it's important to pour for other people. Let's look at what that's all about. So that is actually called oshaku, the art of, the, the manner of pouring for others and not pouring for yourself when it comes to sake. So why, do, why did this manner develop? Why do we not pour for ourselves? Uh, well, I think that it developed, first of all, as a sign of respect to other people. I'm going to pour for you first, uh, put myself a little bit lower position and serve you first. Um, Japanese society can also be a bit hierarchical as well. Uh, that's very true for businesses, it's true for schools, and it's true for many organizations in Japan. Pouring sake for the other people at an event or a party can act as a social icebreaker. And it really allows everybody at an event to interact with each other. 
So if I work at a company and I'm a little bit lower uh, on the totem pole for uh, at a company and my executive vice president is there, uh, pouring sake for that person is a way that I could talk to that person even though we may not talk at the office very much. It's a way to get people interacting, social icebreaker, get people talking to each other. So it's actually really a wonderful way to promote communication at social events. I also view Oshaku, the art of pouring for others, as really a mini ceremony. It's deeply, deeply ingrained in Japanese culture. And um, also this art of pouring for others is one of the reasons behind the small size of Japanese sake cups. So many sake cups that you may see are quite small in size. And the small size allows you to give the honor of pouring to more and more people and allows you to communicate with more people at a social event. That's one of the reasons behind the smaller size of many Japanese sake cups. So let's look at how to pour sake. So if you are at an event and the sake bottle is in front of you, um, the most important rule I think for polite service of sake is to hold the bottle with two hands. Uh, if you've ever studied the art of exchanging business cards with someone in Japan, uh, it's important to present the business card with two hands. Uh, if you've ever seen a Japanese ceremony, a graduation, or some type of certificate presentation, it's always presented with two hands. Uh, if you give someone a gift of money in an envelope, it's presented with two hands. So this presentation with two hands shows a sign of intention and concentration and uh, uh, really focuses uh, the gift on the other person. So when you have a bottle of sake, you wanna pour holding the bottle with two hands. Another very important point, whether you're pouring from a carafe or you're pouring from a bottle, is when you have the carafe pouring, you don't want to touch the carafe or the bottle to the glass. So you don't want this to happen. Some people who may be a little bit nervous about pouring use the edge of the glass as a guide, and that is a big no-no. You don't want to touch the glass at all when you're pouring. Um, some people bring out their finest uh, sake cups. These are called ochoko sake cups for company. They could be very, very old and very valuable. So you have to be very careful when you're pouring for the other person not to hit the cup itself. Another point when you're pouring for someone is you wanna fill the cup they're receiving in about 80% full. Now you may think, well, I wanna give them a lot of sake, so I'll just fill it right up to the brim. But that's actually viewed as impolite in Japan because then you're left with the sake cup right to the brim and it's wobbling all over the place and you're spilling on your fingers. And you, if you fill it 80% full, they can sip on it very easily and it's, it's a polite way to present them just the right amount of sake. And uh, it's also very polite when you're the pourer to keep an eye on everyone else's glass at the table or at the event. Uh, when someone's glass is getting low, when the little bit of sake is gone and it's getting lower, um, as a polite person for sake etiquette, you should take the craft, take the bottle, and offer to refill other, everyone's cup. Now, some people may be asking themselves, well, if I can only pour for other people, how do I get sake in my glass? Uh, there's a very easy way. If you have been drinking your sake, it's getting towards the bottom of the glass and you want a little more and nobody's noticing, uh, what you should do is pick up the carafe or pick up the bottle and start offering to pour for other people. This will immediately get everyone's eyeballs on your glass and you will get your glass refilled right away. So that's my trick for uh, getting your glass filled, even if uh, you can't pour for yourself. All right. So regarding the uh, tokuri in particular, so this again is a Japanese sake carafe. These come in different styles and different sizes. Some are larger, some are smaller. And this is primarily used for warming sake. You can put sake in here, put it in a water bath and warm the sake. But um, uh, what we want to do is uh, be careful of a few rules regarding tokuri. The first one, again, when you're pouring, you want to use two hands to have the mo most polite service. And also, um, if, the, if you pick up the 
carafe off the counter, one thing you don't want to do is shake it like this by your ear to see if there's any sake left in it. And the other thing you definitely don't want to do is treat it like a microscope and try and look in there and see how much sake is left inside. Those are both considered very rude. And if you are uh, at a party and there's several half full carafes uh, on the table, don't take one and try and put them together and you know, fill, fill one back up to the top. That's not good manners either. Okay, so we've talked about how to pour sake. Now, how should you receive sake? So there's a few rules about this. And the number one most important rule when someone comes to pour you sake is to pick up your glass or your cup off the table. I once went to a sake dinner and there were, so this was in Japan, and there were some very uh, high level, highly certified wine people at, at an event I went to. It was uh, sponsored by a sake brewery and there was lots of sake being poured. And the brewer came around the table and uh, reached the tokuri over to pour for one of the wine experts. And the wine expert just kind of leaned back and said, go ahead and pour. And the, these cups are very, very small and we're quite far away from the person pouring. And he had to awkwardly lean in and try and hit the target of that small little cup. So what's considered most polite is to pick up the cup and meet the person pouring halfway. This makes it easy for them to give you the honor of being poured for. And again, two hands. You want to hold the cup with two hands. So one hand, usually your right hand around the cup, and your left hand supporting the cup from below. This is the most formal and the most polite way to receive sake. Now, if someone pours for you and you receive the sake and then you just kind of set it down, uh, that's also not very polite. You want to take a small sip of the sake, even if it's just touching your lips, uh, to acknowledge that the honor that's been given you and that you've received a delicious sake and you acknowledge what they've done for you, you take a small sip and then set the glass down. Um, if you keep drinking all the sake that everyone gives you, this can get into a vicious cycle. So be careful. If you don't want any more sake, uh, you need to leave your glass relatively full. If people keep seeing your glass getting less and less full, they'll keep pouring more and more and more. So be sure if you want to stop the pouring from happening, you want to keep your glass relatively full and people will see that you know you don't need any more and that's a good way to keep things uh, uh, on track at a sake party. All right, now there's another important word we're going to talk about and that word is kampai. We're going to talk about the art of the kampai right now. So kampai is a Japanese word you may have heard. Uh, it means dry cup, literally dry cup. And it is the equivalent to what we say in English as cheers. Uh, or giving a toast, cheers. Uh, often, kampai is yelled quite loudly at different events. Uh, it's a celebratory uh, word. And I often view it as like the starting gun for drinking party. Uh, not much drinking happens before kampai is said. And once kampai, the initial toast for the group is done, um, then things can really begin. So it's kind of a starting point for a drinking party. Uh, people really refrain from drinking before this group kampai is given. Again, that's that sense of wa or group harmony. Uh, we want everyone to partake in the same toast, the same kampai, everyone can be ready. And uh, that preserves that sense of group harmony. There's one thing we do avoid though at the kampai, and that is ikinomi. So ikinomi is shooting your sake or drinking everything in one gulp. And people outside of Japan sometimes see very small sake cups like this, and they think it's a license to shoot or slam down their sake in one gulp. And that is not very polite in Japan. You want to savor and sip your sake. So doing a shot after you get poured at the kampai is not considered polite. We're going to talk now about formal versus informal etiquette when it comes to sake. And the, you can easily sum this up. The, the more formal the situation, the more strict the sake etiquette's gonna be. And I thought it might be fun to look at some situations you would come across 
in uh, formal settings and some situations you might see at casual settings. So let's take a look and talk about formal settings first. So formal settings you can see here in the picture could be something like a wedding banquet or a formal business dinner or some other type of formal celebration. Um, often the kampai drink is pre-poured and everyone has the same thing and it's waiting for you at your plate. This ensures that the kampai can uh, keep the group harmony. Everyone has the same thing. Everyone is ready to go. We don't have to check. Does everyone have their drink? Can we do our kampai? Everything is preset for these more formal types of events. Um, very often at formal events and banquets, there will be a speech before the kampai. This is uh, usually given by the VIP or an associate of the guest of honor. Uh, sometimes the business president would give a speech, uh, some type of acknowledgement about the occasion. And then the person leading the kampai, that's actually uh, an honor to have that role at a banquet. Um, and uh, once the kampai is given, then again, that's the starting gun for the uh, fun to begin and uh, people can drink more freely after that. Now, if you, do, if you are at a formal event and you have a kampai and you're going to be doing uh, a cheers with your people standing around you, very often you uh, would touch your glasses like this, you know, cheers, uh, very common. Uh, you see that often in Japan. But I wanna clue you into one subtle detail about this. If you're uh, coming close to someone and you're going to cheers, um, it's considered polite to lower your glass a little bit compared to the other person if they are of a higher status than you or you want to show them some respect or some honor. Um, it's considered polite to lower your glass just a tiny bit. Um, for example, if you are doing a cheers with a, a very uh, dedicated teacher that you have a lot of respect for, you could lower your glass a little bit when you do a cheers and kind of bow a little bit. Or if you are doing it with the company president, uh, you can give a cheers a little bit lower. Um, and you can also do it with people who are at the same status with you, just as a nod to honor them and make yourself a little bit more humble and you know exalt them just a bit. But I've seen very comical situations where people actually race to the bottom and almost go under the table trying to be the lowest, lowest person doing the, the uh, cheers. So uh, it's just to be aware. It's a really, really wonderful touch if you're doing a cheers with someone glass to glass and um, you can offer them that little honor to be just a little bit lower than them and uh, raise them up just a bit. So it's something to be aware of. And you're, again, you're gonna see that a little bit more in more formal situations. Now, there's one unique service style that is generally uh, pretty rare, but something I have experienced myself in Japan. And this is called Kenpai Henpai. Uh, this is most common in the Kochi region of Japan. And this is a drinking style where you take a cup filled with sake and you, if I'm a more junior member at a business dinner, I can offer the sake to my superior and that is the kenpai. And then the senior can take it and drink it and then get it filled with sake and return it to me. That's the henpai. So it is the art of drinking out of the same cup, sharing a cup. And uh, it's not terribly common, but I have had brewers show me this drinking style when I visited sake breweries in the past. If you look at the picture on the slide, you're gonna see a very beautiful older sake set. Uh, there's carafes, there's sake cups, and there's this footed bowl there too. That bowl is actually called a haisen bowl, and it evolved as part of a sake service for this very reason, kenpai henpai. What it's used for is it's filled with water, and after you drink, you dip the cup upside down in the water and kind of give it a rinse. You get it filled with sake and then you hand it back to the other person. So that's a, it's a nod towards hygienics with sharing a cup with someone. Uh, 
Now, the purpose of this sharing a cup is really uh, to seal a deal or uh, say that you're simpatico with someone. Uh, if you're two business people and you've signed a contract, this would be a, you know, a, a wonderful way to say that you've, you know, you're on the same page and uh, you are now in business together. You're drinking from the same cup. When I was researching this, I actually found that um, there were very recent articles in the last month or so that actively discouraged people in Kochi Prefecture from doing this Kempai Hempai uh, mini ceremony of sharing a cup to avoid transmission of the virus, uh, the COVID virus. So it's a very, uh, it's a very ancient style, a very old fashioned style of drinking, very old fashioned manners and etiquette, but it is right up in uh, modern news cycles right now because of the COVID virus. So people are being very discouraged from doing this cup sharing. Okay, so let's move on to informal settings. Now this is gonna be your uh, izakaya, your sake pub, your sake bar, or even private dinners. <clears throat> So when you have a social event at uh, izakaya, private uh, party, you very often see kampai, so a cheers as well. And you often see the oshaku service as well. That's where you don't pour for yourself, you pour for the other person. Um, and at the beginning of the evening, that is very much more strictly adhered to. But as the evening progresses, and people have a little bit more to drink. It's a casual situation, people let their hair down. This strict rule of pouring for the other person uh, exclusively uh, does tend to fall by the wayside depending on how casual and informal the event is. Um, however, when you do have an informal uh, drinking party, I have noticed from my own personal experience that when you do the kampai, the initial drink, it is very uh, polite to all drink the same type of beverage. So uh, I learned this the hard way. Um, I'm a big fan of sake. Sake is my whole life and my career. And I would, uh, when I first got to Japan, I would go out for a little a fun drinking party with some friends and uh, they would all order beer. And I would say, oh, I want sake for my first drink. And everyone would look at me like, oh, so I was disturbing the wa. I was disturbing the group harmony. It makes everyone feel good when you can all share the same thing and create that uh, good vibes for the group. Uh, so I pretty quickly picked up on that and realized that even if beer isn't my favorite, for the sake of the group, we're going to all drink the same type of drink for the initial kampai, the initial cheers. And that creates good group harmony. Also, when you are pouring and receiving sake at these more informal type of events, it is um, more usual that you would see someone pouring with one hand versus pouring with two hands. Pouring with two hands and receiving with two hands is something that uh, gives a much more formal air to that exchange. And even if people are sticking to the rule of pouring for others, it's much more likely as things get more casual, again, people let their hair down, that you might pour with one hand and when you receive the sake, you might receive with one hand, just with one hand like that. Um, when people do do a kampai in very casual environments like uh, izakayas and things like that, very often, almost always, the drink that is chosen is beer. Beer is the most popular alcohol in Japan. And very often, Japanese people start a kampai or social drinking session with a beer. But there is a movement called Nihonshu de Kampai. So that literally means doing cheers with Japanese sake. And there are some areas of Japan, some pockets of uh, areas where the, uh, the culture is trying to promote doing your first cheers, your first round, your first kampai with sake instead of beer. And I think that's a wonderful movement. And many brewers that we work with in the sake industry promote this nihonshu de kampai or cheers with sake. I think that's a wonderful, wonderful culture. Uh, finally, um, we're going to look at something that I get asked about more than just about anything else, and that is called mokiri, mokiri. This is the overflow serving style that you often see in sake pubs and izakayas and more informal settings. 
Um, let me know in the chat if you have seen this before in your Japanese restaurants, a kind of taking a square box. So this is called a masu. It's a Japanese uh, a wooden sake cup called a masu, square in shape. And they put a glass inside of it. They pour sake in and overflow the glass into the masu. So let me know in the chat if you've actually seen that yourself. Now, the meaning behind this overflow service style is to give people a little bit more than they paid for. Um, it's a sign of hospitality and a sign of generosity. And, uh, but it's something you see definitely in more casual situations. Uh, if you think this is an ancient tradition going back to the samurai in the Edo period, you are wrong. This is something that's relatively new. This overflow service style really developed in the post-World War II era when prosperity returned to Japan, people were going out drinking more often for business purposes. This uh, custom of overflowing people's cups into a masu really took hold and started to develop. Um, but it's a relatively new thing in the hit long history of sake. So this isn't an ancient tradition by any means. But how do you drink it? This is the number one question I get. Um, I did actually did a few diagrams here. Um, so, if you have a, a sake poured into your masu and it's overflowed, if you try and drink it like this, you're, without taking anything out, the, the drips are gonna happen right away. So my recommended drinking style for this particular uh, type of service, this mokiri, is to lift the cup out and let it drip back into the masu, drip, drip, drip. When the drips have stopped, you can drink out of the glass, and when you have enough out of the glass, you can pour from the masu, the remaining sake in here, into the glass, and then continue to drink out of the glass. Some people do it the opposite. They pour into here, and then they drink out of the masu, but I prefer to drink out of the glass. I think it's a little more elegant, so you pour the little bit that's in here into the glass. Nothing goes to waste. You can continue to rest the cup in here, uh, but you want to drink out of the glass. So that's my uh, way to solve that problem. Uh, so we've talked about formal settings, informal settings, and all different manner of sake etiquette and service. So I hope that was interesting for all of you. Uh, and what we're actually going to do now is move on to some of the questions that we have. And we're going to do about 15 minutes of a Q&A. All right? Excellent. So I'm going to have some of the questions coming in here. All right. So let's see. Okay, so there's a great question here. Um, Chef Les from Hungary, uh, does it matter who you pour for first? For example, should you pour the closest to you last? That's a great question. Well, it really depends on, again, how formal the situation is. Um, if you're in a more informal situation, you can pour for the people closest to you first uh, and Generally, people who are further away, someone will take the bottle from you and pour for them, make sure everyone has their glass poured. Um, if you're at a more formal situation, uh, you would want to pour for the VIP in the group or the, the most honored guest first, and then go down to the, the more uh, junior person at the event. So you'd want to make sure that the person who was the VIP got poured for first. Okay, let's see if we have another question. Oh, this is a good one. If you can't check the tokuri is empty, how do you know how much is in there? I asked this very question to a sake brewer once, and he said, you have to judge by the weight. You have to judge by the weight. So um, if you are gonna be a host at an event, you may wanna check the weight of a full tokuri, see how heavy it feels, and you, you're supposed to judge by the weight of the tokuri, all right? Okay, let's see. Has COVID affected the ability to import and how is that affecting operations in Japan? Um, well, uh, there are, I think there is some slowing of the uh, exports from Japan. And as the market has contracted here in the US, I think that the distributors here are purchasing a little bit less. So there's a general slowdown of overall exports. Um, as things improve and restaurants begin to reopen, I think we'll see a uh, return to uh, 
relatively normal conditions, uh, but it will take some time to recover and we'll have to see how the restaurant industry in particular has been doing. The uh, retail industry uh, where they have um, uh, seen a big increase in sales, uh, that's been doing well. But the restaurant industry is just beginning to come back out and we're gonna see how quickly things recover. And if things go well, there'll be more, more orders and more export happening. Okay, so I have another question. Do these rules of etiquette apply to shochu as well? Or even for that matter, do they apply to beer or wine? Well, I think some of them do. For the uh, pouring of, of alcohol for other people, this oshaku idea, I think that that really um, does have to do, that could be involved with any type of alcohol. So if you're pouring beer for someone, um, again, if you're holding a beer bottle and you're pouring for someone in a more formal situation, you could very much uh, hold that bottle with two hands. That indicates a more formal type of interaction. Uh, if you're pouring with one hand, that indicates a more informal way. But that does, uh, I've seen it done with beer, with shochu, and with wine as well. So whenever you're pouring alcohol, you can consider these um, types of situations. But you're not going to see this mokiri, this overflow type of situation or uh, some of the other very particular sake culture types of manners that we talked about, you won't see. But the general pouring for other people, uh, you, you will see that, and you will see the two-handed service style when things are being a little bit more formal. Okay, which came first, masu or cup? That's a great question. So we have the masu, which is the um, wooden, uh, box here, and we have sake cups. Like here's an older style ochoko, sake cup. So um, definitely ochokos came first. So the type of sake cup uh, has been made from ceramic and earthenware for a long, long time. Uh, the masu actually started out as a measurement for rice. So this used to be like a measuring scoop for measuring dry rice. And over time, it morphed into a drinking vessel. Um, but the, um, the origin of this shape is actually a measurement for rice service of you know, ordering a certain amount of rice. And uh, again, it morphed over time into a drinking vessel. So um, the cup has been around, the ochoko has been around much longer than, than this has as a drinking vessel. All right, let's see what else we have here. Is drinking out of a wine glass a strictly Western concept? Uh, well, I think a long time ago it was, but in modern sake service in Japan, you commonly see wine glasses used to serve sake in high-end restaurants for premium sake. You may not see them so much in very, very casual pubs for more inexpensive sake. But if you have a higher end sake restaurant that's serving a nice aromatic sake, very often you can see that service in a wine glass. Or if you're ordering a new premium champagne method sparkling sake, it's quite common to see that served in a flute as well. So uh, we have a, a hybrid now, a mix of service styles and service wear. Uh, the more casual, you're going to get the more classic ochoko and guinomi. Those are the standard classic type of sake cups. And uh, for higher end service, for premium sakes, you can see wine glasses, champagne flutes. And uh, so you get the whole array and both are wonderful. You really want to find the right type of glass for the sake that you're drinking. All right. Oh, this is an interesting question uh, from Cindy. For formal events, do they strictly pour filtered sake or is unfiltered sake allowed? Well, um, there's no rules against uh, cloudy sake. We actually call uh, that type of sake, it's a milky white, it's called nigori in Japanese. It's a cloudy style sake. And uh, it is considered not as formal as a clear premium sake. Um, the sakes that are pressed clear uh, have a, a little bit more of a, a premium nuance to them. So 
at the most formal events, you probably would not see cloudy sake being served uh, as it has a little bit more of a rough and ready feel to it. But there's no rule necessarily against serving cloudy sake. So I would say it's up to the host, uh, but clear sake is keeps the glasses clean and it's a very elegant style of service. So I think you are more likely to see clear sake at formal events. Okay, let's see what other questions we have. <clears throat> okay, let's see. All right, here's a good question. Is the bullseye at the bottom of many sake cups a way of judging clarity? All right, so if you haven't seen this before, it's a great question. Uh, at the bottom of sake cups, you have this blue and white ring, okay? And this is called a uh, janome in Japanese. It means snake eye, and it's something that in the West we would call a bullseye design. And this is at the bottom of the inside of sake cups. And the original purpose of this design, this high contrast design, a dark blue against the white, was to look down into the sake and see how clear the edge was. If your sake had impurities or if your sake had haze to it, you couldn't see the, the crisp line between the blue and the white. Um, nowadays, most sakes are charcoal filtered and uh, we don't use it as much for that particular uh, purpose, but it's become a symbol of the sake industry, this janome. You see it very often. Uh, as a symbol part of a design for the sake industry, and I think it's absolutely charming. And uh, that's, the, that's the idea behind this. So you can use it to judge the clarity, but with modern premium sake, we don't need it for that purpose that much anymore, uh, but it's a wonderful symbol and design element for the sake industry. All right. Oh, I like this question too. Would it be bad practice to pop the cork on a sparkling sake. I think that the sake industry for a premium champagne method sparkling sake, they very often have a cork and a cage, just like sparkling wine. And I think they take the lead from uh, the etiquette of sparkling wine, which is when you open a bottle of sparkling wine under pressure, it's not considered best form to have it pop really loudly and make a big noise and flow all over the place. You really want just a gentle hiss and you want it to be as discreet as possible. That's the proper way to open a sparkling wine. And I think that for service of premium champagne method sparkling sakes, we take our lead from the wine in industry there and we want service to be very elegant. So we also try to ensure that when we open up that sparkling bottle, um, it is quiet and gentle and not distracting to anybody. Okay, let's see. Okay, hot versus cold sake. Does it depend on what it's being served with? So I assume that means the food. So when you serve hot sake versus cold sake, when should you serve them? Well, my experience living in Japan and working at a sake brewery has been that it's quite driven by the seasons. So when it gets cold out, especially where I lived in Niigata, Japan, the snow was you know up to six feet deep in the winter. Uh, there was a strong desire to drink warm sake during this time. The foods in the winter were more hearty and more rich, so there's a natural pairing there. The summers in Japan are quite humid, and the thought of drinking warm sake in the height of the summer is a little bit of a challenge. So of course, colder sake is more preferred then. But I think any time of the year, it's really a question of personal preference. Um, I always try to match the weight and the feeling of the food with the weight and the feeling of the sake. So if I'm having some light sashimi, really uh, crisp and well chilled, and uh, I want a nice, clean, light, cold sake with that, that sounds like a good match. If I'm having a hearty nabe or a hot pot stew, uh, maybe a warm sake would really bring out the umami in that dish. So uh, you can pair with the food, but I really think it's down to the season and also the personal preference of the person who's enjoying the sake. Okay. Uh, 
Okay, here's a very detailed question about the pour over. Does the sake glass inside the masu have to be an ochoko? And is there a height limit for the glass? Interesting. Well, very often uh, you see the type of glass I see most often used put into the masu here is what I call a tulip shaped glass. I, I don't have one here with me, but it starts out kind of narrow and flares out at the top. And maybe it's like three or four inches tall. And that type of uh, what I again call the tulip shape is most often used. Um, you should have a little bit of height so that when you see the overflow, uh, you can you know, have a little bit more of a dramatic effect and you can catch the leftover in, in the, the masu. Um, <clears throat> so uh, ochoko is uh, this type of a cup. You know, this is the standard. If you put this in, it kind of disappears in there. So you really want to have something with a little bit more height to it. And a clear glass kind of uh, tulip style is what a lot of people use for doing the overflow mokiri style of pouring. That was a very good question, thank you. Okay, we have a few more questions here. Let's see. Oh, I like this question. Um, can you bring a bottle of sake as a gift to a friend's party? the way you would bring a bottle of wine in America? If so, how should you choose it? All right, well, if you come to a party at my house, I really hope you're bringing a bottle of sake with you. Uh, kidding aside, that is a wonderful hostess gift or a gift to bring to your friends. Uh, if they don't have experience with sake, I think it's important to encourage them to drink the sake relatively soon if they don't open it that night with you. Uh, I've had many people ask me at events, and uh, different uh, functions that I go to, they tell me that their parents received sake as a gift from a Japanese couple in 1973, and they've kept the bottle all this time in the basement. They wanna know how much it's worth and how, can, how has the sake developed and will it be more delicious? And I have to break it to them that sake is meant to be uh, most often than not enjoyed relatively soon. And uh, you want to um, drink sake uh, within one year generally of getting it. So I always say carpe diem, carpe sake, drink the sake that you have and enjoy it. It's a wonderful thing to bring as a gift. But again, if your friends don't have much experience with sake, you want to make sure that they know not to save it too long and to carpe sake, to drink it as quickly as possible. It's meant to be enjoyed and it's a wonderful gift to bring. So we're going to move on now to introduce the sakes. And I'd love to hear in the chat if anyone purchased sakes from the list that was provided uh, with this event, if you have any of the sakes, I'm going to review uh, the sakes, um, a few of them, and also we're gonna talk about each brewery very briefly. So the first brewery in the lineup, these are all um, uh, sakes that were on the list, the Sake Export Association Group. Uh, the first one, we're gonna go from the north of Japan to the south of Japan, and we're starting in the northernmost prefecture, Hokkaido. This is Takasago Brewery, uh, and their, I think their signature sake really is this Junmai Ginjo Tai Setsu. This is a dry sake that has a full rice flavor. Uh, it has a boldness to it, a dry finish, very food friendly. Uh, this style of sake is uh, indicative of the rice grains that you can get in the north, uh, the far north of Japan, and it's a really delicious uh, drier sake. Moving on to Nambu Bijin. So Nambu Bijin is a brewery from Iwate Prefecture. That's on the, in the north of Japan on the Pacific Ocean side of the main island of Japan. And their signature sake is Nambu Bijin Tokubetsu Junmai, the special Junmai. Uh, this sake won uh, the championship award at the, I believe it's the 2017 IWC International Wine Challenge. It won the Best Sake Championship Award. Uh, it is um, lively and it is fruity and it's really lovely. And one of the best things about this sake is that it's an affordable style of sake. It's a tokubetsu junmai. Uh, so you can drink it very easily, very quaffable style of sake. And Mr. Kuji, the president of Nambu Bijan, is a wonderful guy and um, he welcomes many people to his brewery and spreads the word of sake all over the world. So uh, that's the story with uh, Nambu Bijin. And we're moving on now to Akita. 
Akita is also in the north of Japan, but on the Sea of Japan side. Uh, this is Akita Seishu, and their brand is called Deiwatsuru. And their Kimoto Junmai is a real flagship sake for this brewery. Uh, it's gamey, it's fine-grained, and it has a very layered deep flavor. So it has a little bit of earthiness to it. It's great served warm, and it's a very food-friendly sake. More robust style, but absolutely delicious. So the next brewery we're gonna look at is in Miyagi Prefecture. Now Miyagi, again, is on the Pacific side of the main island of Japan. And uh, the brewery we're talking about here is Uchigasaki. And this is a brewery that makes a brand of sake called Hoyo. Uh, their, one of their flagship sakes is Kura no Hana, which is a Junmai Daiginjo. Uh, this is a very light, balanced sake. Uh, it has a hint of anise flavor, uh, but overall great balance and a uh, very, very smooth, delicious texture. It's a lovely, lovely, very elegant Junmai Daiginjo. So moving on to uh, Fukushima. Uh, the brewery we're going to look at from Fukushima is uh, Okunomatsu Brewery. Uh, they are very well known for making excellent quality sake. And the one I want to highlight here from Okunomatsu is the Tokubetsu Junmai. This is a sake I remember drinking early on in my sake career, and uh, it has an overall dry body uh, and a nice uh, clean finish, crisp, just enough rice flavor, and a very, very good balance overall. Very, again, a very food-friendly style of sake. And this Tokubetsu Junmai is, I think, one of the flagship sakes from Okunomatsu Brewery. All right, moving on to the next one, uh, Tentaka Sake Brewery from Tochigi Prefecture. So Tochigi is one of the prefectures that is landlocked, meaning it doesn't have access to the Sea of Japan or the Pacific Ocean. Uh, the brand uh, here is Tentaka. And the sake I want to highlight um, on this slide is the Daiginjo. Uh, this is known as Silent Stream in English. And this is a sake that has a very luxury feel to it, very silky in texture, uh, very pristine uh, and great balance overall. But when I drink the sake, I really remember the, the texture. It's, it's very, very silky and fine and gives you a wonderful feeling of luxury and elegance. So I really enjoy that sake. So that's Tentaka. All right, moving on to Sudo Honke. So this is Ibaraki. Ibaraki is just north of Tokyo, the area of Tokyo. And they have one sake here, Sato no Homare Junmai Ginjo. Now this brewery is unique. It was founded in 1141 AD. Um, it's considered the oldest sake brewery that is still actively brewing sake in Japan. And the current president is the 55th generation president, which is kind of mind boggling when you think about it. Uh, their sake is very elegant, lovely fruit aromas, and just uh, absolutely delicious sake. Um, it's a little bit on the lighter side, not too heavy, not earthy at all, very silky, very elegant, and um, uh, they have more experience than anybody with all their years of brewing, and this sake is the culmination of all that, so they do a wonderful job. Again, that's Sudo Honke from Ibaraki. And the next brewery we're going to look at is uh, Kaetsu. Kayatsu Sake Brewery, this is from Niigata. Um, the brand name here is Kambara, Kambara. And I lived in Niigata Prefecture, uh, so I think it's one of the parts of Japan that I'm most familiar with. And what struck me about the Kambara Sake, their Junmai Ginjo uses Gohyaku Mangoku Sake Rice. And that's a real mouthful, Gohyaku Mangoku. Uh, but that strain of sake rice is native to the Niigata region and it's known for making cleaner, airier styles of sake. And uh, that ties in with the Niigata ethos, the Niigata regional style, which is clean, crisper, and light. Uh, this sake, the Kambara Junmai Ginjo, gives us that. It has a very elegant texture to it, 
uh, very clean overall, very food friendly again, and a nice dry finish on the sake. So it's a wonderful example of the Niigata brewing style. And again, that's Kaetsu, and the brand name is Kambara. All right, moving on to Miyoya Shuzo. Uh, this is in Ishikawa Prefecture. And Ishikawa is a very beautiful place. It's on the Sea of Japan. It's a peninsula that sticks out into the Sea of Japan. Very well known for seafood. And the brewery brand name is Yuho. And the uh, product I wanted to spotlight here is their Junmai Shu. Yuho Junmai is grainy and almost nutty in flavor. Very, very deep uh, flavor. Uh, very, very delicious. Uh, spreads wide on the palate. Lots of depth of flavor, too. Uh, so this is one of those heartier sakes that can stand up to uh, very interesting food pairings. You can pair with more uh, robust foods. And uh, it's an absolutely delicious sake, but it falls more on the full-bodied, uh, umami-driven side of the spectrum. Absolutely delicious. So again, that's Yuho brand from Miyoya Shuzo. Okay. The next brewery we're going to look at is Nambu Shuzojo. So this is Nambu Brewery. This is in Fukui Prefecture. And uh, the brand name for this brewery is Hanagaki. Hanagaki. The sake that I wanted to look at here is the Hanagaki Junmai. Uh, this sake is more umami driven as well. Uh, not too far from the Yuho Brewery in Japan. And uh, this has a full flavor, a more dense palate, and a nice earthiness as well. These sakes that have a bit more earthiness uh, can pair well with some of the umami-rich foods that we find in Japanese cuisine. Uh, so that again is Nambu Shuzo. Okay, the next brewery we're going to Okayama, Okayama Prefecture. Uh, Marumoto Sake Brewery. And they make a sake um, that is a lot of fun uh, called Chikurin Hohoshu. So the brand name is Chikurin, and they make this wonderful sake, Hohoshu, uh, which is a sparkling sake. It's lower alcohol, about 8%, quite sweet, uh, but it's balanced with tartness, with acidity. And it is very refreshing and very, very fun to drink. So if you get a chance to try this, please do. Again, that's Chikurin Hohoshu from Okayama. Okay, moving on to our next brewery. All right, uh, so now we're looking at Imada Sake Brewery. This is in Hiroshima Prefecture. And uh, they make a wonderful selection of sakes, but I wanted to talk about their uh, Junmai Ginjo Sake. So the brand name is Fukucho, Fukucho, and this is their Junmai Ginjo. Uh, this one is very fragrant, a little bit fruity, a little bit of floral on the aroma, uh, but a lovely balanced sake, uh, good depth of flavor as well. So it's not just fruity, you get a bit of rice in there and overall a great balance and really well integrated sake. Very food friendly style and something you can uh, drink very, very easily. So um, it's a very enjoyable sake. And I remember drinking this sake very early on again in my sake career. It was been available for quite a while in the US. And I remember this being one of those sakes that uh, kept me going and wanting to learn more about sake. So that's a Fukucho Junmai Ginjo. Next, we're gonna move on to Asahi Sake Brewery. Uh, this is the well-known brand Dasai. Uh, they're in Yamaguchi Prefecture which is on the far west of Honshu Island, the main island of Japan. Uh, they have a uh, production of only Junmai Daiginjo sake. So that's the pure rice style, the super premium grade. So Dasai focuses only on making uh, these super premium pure rice sakes, only Junmai Daiginjo. And the one I wanted to talk about was their Dasai 23. The 23 here refers to the rice milling percentage. So how much of the rice remains after milling? So this rice grain was milled down to 23% remaining. That makes this a very luxurious sake. 
and it comes out very rich, quite fruity on the nose. And again, a big impression of uh, luxury and silkiness to the texture. Uh, wonderful sake to give as a gift and to enjoy with friends, uh, but overall fruity, rich, and very silky. So that's a uh, Dasai out of Yamaguchi. Moving on to uh, Rihaku Sake Brewery. This is in Shimane. Uh, the sake here that I wanted to highlight is Rihaku Junmai Ginjo. This is called Wandering Poet in English. And uh, the name Rihaku is actually the name of a Chinese poet uh, known in English as Li Po. And he was a famous poet in the 700s. And he was known for his fondness of sake, of alcohol. So they've named this brand after this famous poet, Rihaku. Uh, this is a very, very well-balanced sake, a uh, little bit of fruitiness, a little bit of rice flavor, overall great balance and good structure absolutely delicious. Uh, the next sake we're going to look at is from Tenzan Sake Brewery in Saga Prefecture. So we've moved down uh, off the main island of Japan, now we're in Kyushu, and um, this brand is called Shichida. And I wanted to focus on the Shichida Junmai. Uh, this is very full, rich, and a very complex sake with a nice acidity to balance that out. Full rice flavor, uh, but balanced with a wonderful texture, really, really well integrated and a uh, nice bright acidity at the finish. Uh, so you get uh, so much balance, uh, really drinkable, really delicious, super well-crafted sake. Again, that's Tenzan out of Saga. And our final brewery is Chiyo no Sono. Uh, they make a brand named after their brewery, Chiyo no Sono. Uh, I want to talk about their Junmai Ginjo. It's called Sacred Power in English. Uh, this is also in Kyushu Island and uh, Kumamoto Prefecture. Now, this sake is uh, full flavored, uh, very rich in texture, and I find the aromatics to be almost herbaceous uh, in aroma. So a uh, very, very uh, delicious sake and a uh, very, very full uh, flavor. Uh, but great balance as well. And again, a very food-friendly sake from Chiyo no Sono. All right. Well, that takes us to the end of our uh, lecture. So we learned about sake etiquette. We had some Q&A. And we also talked about um, all the sakes from the co-organizers uh, of this event, all the brewers that are working together to make this event possible. Um, I want to thank you all so much for having me talk to you tonight about sake. Um, if you want to check out, I have a website, podcast, and you can check me out on social media as well. That information is on the slide now. Um, I want to thank everybody for uh, listening in. I hope you learned something, and I hope we can stay in touch. Uh, I hope you enjoyed this sake lecture as well. So thank you all so much for joining, and I want to say a final kampai. Uh, loud and clear, and this is the starting gun for our evening sake drinking. So kampai everyone, thank you for being with us tonight. It was wonderful to chat with all of you, and I hope to see you next time. Kampai, thank you so much. <laughs>